please be seated. If you have your Bibles with you tonight, turn with me to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 1 is where I'm going to begin. We're going to look through the whole book of Ephesians tonight, but don't panic. I won't, I won't keep you long, I promise. The book of Ephesians has commonly, and I believe correctly, been called the Alps of the New Testament. Because you see, the view from Ephesians is breathtaking, it's inspiring, it's motivating, and indeed, you climb up into the very heavenlies in this book. In Ephesians, we see ourselves seated with Christ in the heavenlies, and it, it does something to you and to me that is very, very practical. Because once we see where we are and who we are in Christ because of what He's done for us, we find ourselves wanting to engage in service for Him and be involved in ministry, whatever that might mean for you and for me. But I like the order that is laid out here in Ephesians. The first three chapters of the book deal with doctrine. Again, we, we climb and we see who we are in Jesus and what Christ has done for you and for me. And then the last three chapters of Ephesians is duty. That is, because of who we are, then we get to do. It's, it's not we've got to do it. It's not we have to do it. But it's what we get to do because of who we are in Christ. And it is my opinion that this is a very real problem in the life of many Christians. And indeed, a number of churches today. There are people and churches in some cases that emphasize the duty before they understand the doctrine. And so it becomes sort of a, a works-oriented, legalistic kind of ministry mentality. But folks, I want to say in reality, if you just bask, if you just take in and absorb and ponder on and think through and rejoice in what Christ has done for you, you will find yourself saying, hey man, how can I serve him? And so when the Apostle Paul later on in the book says that if you're a wife, you should submit to your husband, when your mindset is right, you'd be like, okay, no problem. But you see, if we haven't understood chapters 1, 2, and 3, you're going to go, wait a minute, that's chauvinism. That's out of date with today's feministic thinking. Or, or when it says, children, obey your parents. If you haven't really been in chapters 1, 2, and 3 and seen who you are and what he has done, then that is going to sound like, it's going to feel like a burden. It's just another heavy obligation. And this... And this really, I have observed over the years, is a common problem with Christian people. They will read through very quickly, if they even read at all, chapters 1, 2, and 3, because they want to get to studying about the husbands and wives and employees and employers, you know, about the practical stuff. But then that becomes very burdensome and legalistic and they, they chafe at it, they wrestle with it, they argue over it because they really haven't spent time in the first three chapters of Ephesians. May I say to you tonight, there is a divine design you will see. So we get to spend time here just climbing up this mountain and seeing who we are in Christ. You see, these three chapters are indeed some of the most glorious chapters in all of the scriptures, and that is without question. 
And I'm going to open myself up with you a little bit tonight. Forty years ago, I remember saying to myself, man, I'm going to get my family together and my wife is going to submit to me and I'm going to love her and our kids are going to be obedient. I'm going to be a good employee and when I start my own business, I'm going to be a great employer whatever that might be, I'm going to nail down chapters 4, 5, and 6 of all this practical stuff. And folks, I walked and walked and walked and I walked and I found that I really wasn't gaining very much elevation. In fact, I just expended a whole lot of energy spinning my wheels and Traveling in many, many cases in the totally wrong direction. And tonight, I'd like to take our church to the mountaintop. I want us to see and to understand these doctrinal truths. You see, these points that have been written, they're not boring points of theology. They're not there for some scholars just to discuss in minute detail. These truths are meant for you and they're meant for me and they are to elevate us up into the heavenlies. And that way we will see, we will hear, we will realize the tasks that are before us in this world that they won't be burdensome to us. They won't be obligations upon us. And I know this, that some of us have been walking in the wrong direction, trying to get things right in our lives and in our homes. But folks, in reality, you must first be seated with Christ in the heavenlies. You see, the order of affections is to first sit, sit with Christ in the heavenlies. And then we're going to see in chapter 4 in verse 1 to walk worthy of, of the vocation. And then in chapter 6, we're going to see we are to stand fast. You see, the order of Ephesians is sit first in the heavenlies, then walk worthy, and finally stand fast or steadfastly. But you know, we encourage so often people to stand fast. Hold your ground. And then start walking for him. And maybe someday you'll get to sit in the heavenlies. You see, we reverse the order. We tell our kids, we tell each other, stand fast and then start walking. And then someday you'll be seated in the heavenlies, whatever that might mean. But in the Bible, may I say in grace-oriented theology, it is sitting first with Christ. Then walking worthy of Christ. And that becomes a natural response. And then, standing fast in Christ. And oh, friend, let me tell you, it works well. Look with me at the first verse in the first chapter of Ephesians. We read, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus. Let me stop right there for a moment. You might say, well, Jay, (laughs) I am not a saint at Ephesus. Well, you're not at Ephesus, but let me say you are a saint. You know, we have the tendency to think of saints as, we think of them in terms of, of groups of cardinals or bishops who analyze a person's life and they determine if it meets the requirements for sainthood. But folks, that is not what the word saint means. The word saint simply means set apart. But let's keep reading. Still in verse 1, the second half of the verse says, And to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Thus, because the Apostle Paul writes to this set of to the set apart ones, you know, the saints, the saved ones. If you're a Christian, this letter is for you. And let me ask you a question here. Is there anyone here tonight that'll say, hey, yeah, 
I'm one of those faithful in Jesus Christ. Would you raise your hand with me, please? Okay, a few of you. Let me ask again, is anyone in here a faithful in Jesus Christ? Could I see your hands? Okay, good, good. Let's go over to chapter 2 and verse 6. You read it to yourselves as I read it. Verse 6, chapter 2 says, And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Look at the first half of this verse. It says, And hath raised us up together. Christ was raised in a physical resurrection. Now I think we all realize that here tonight. Because of Christ's resurrection, we know that our body will be raised from the dead. And that we have been given power as Christians to live now. You see, these ideas here are combined in Paul's message of sitting with Christ in heavenly places. Our eternal life with Christ is certain because we are united in His powerful victory. And on the basis of that, a future physical resurrection or transformation will occur for all of those of us who are living at the time of the rapture. Now the second half of that verse says this, made us sit together. Here's that sit that Paul speaks of. God sets us down alongside of Christ in the heavenly realms and relations. God has already accomplished this. You see, He dealt with us in Christ. He sees us in or He sees us through Christ. And because of Christ's resurrection, our eternal life with Christ is certain because we are united in His powerful victory. Thank you for those amens. So, when we realize that we are indeed seated with Christ, we can then begin to walk. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. Paul said, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Now, I know you've heard this before. I know you've heard this behind this pulpit before. That word, therefore, that is a pivotal word in the Scripture. And whenever you come across that word, therefore, it's good to stop and ask yourself, what is it there for? Now, in this particular case... The Apostle Paul begins the second half of his letter. He launches into the practical aspects of our life in Christ. He refers to here the doctrinal foundations that he laid down in chapters 1, 2, and 3. In other words, listen, in other words, before telling us how to walk, he reminds us once again that we most, first of all, must understand where... We sit. It's in chapters 1, 2, and 3 that Paul tells us we're adopted into God's family. It says we were chosen before the foundation of the world. It says we are redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. He said we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. This is where so many Christians start to stumble. We try to walk before we actually sit. Come on, you know this. Sermons are preached, seminars are given, books are published on how husbands should love their wives and the way that wives should submit to their husbands or the way that we should live in purity or what we should do as a church body all without even acknowledging what God has already done for us. All without factoring in the fact that there is nothing we can do to make God love us any more that He loves us right now. Now sadly, sadly I have come to realize that most Christians believe that they are the initiators in the spiritual life. 
feeling that if, if they can just pray enough, if they can do enough, if they can be enough, then God will love them and bless them. So they try to walk worthy, but sooner or later they're going to fail and they just throw in the towel. Grace Baptist Church family, our Christian walk is not something that we do trying to earn God's favor or His merit or His love, but rather it is a response to how He loves us, what He's done for us, and how good He's already been to us. We love Him, the Apostle John said, because He first loved us. Get this. He, God, is the initiator. We are to be the responders. We don't love Him so He'll love us. We love Him because He first loved us. You know, most of us, most of us in here are parents. And if you were to try to teach your child to walk before that child learned how to sit, you'd be headed for a lot of frustration. May I say to you, if you try to walk spiritually before you understand where you are seated with Christ, you're going to rebel. But friend, if we simply remind ourselves over and over and over and over again that the, what the Lord has done for us and how He loves us and that we indeed are seated with Him in heavenly places. There, there is nothing that you can do to cause Him to love you anymore. May I say, you watch and see how you will begin to automatically just walk with Him. You see, without chapters 1, 2, and 3... Chapters 4, 5, and 6 just lead to frustration and legalism and rebellion. That's why, back to this verse, that's why the Apostle Paul uses that word, therefore. He's saying, in light of all that you have, in light of all that's been done, in light of all that you are in Christ Jesus, he says, walk worthy. How? Well, we're going to look at that in the second half. Second half of that verse, still in chapter 4. That ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. You see, in the second half of this letter, we here at Grace Baptist Church, you know who I'm talking about, the saints, those of us who are the faithful in Christ Jesus, the emphasis throughout this book mostly is about walking. In addition to this word walk in this verse here in verse 1, the Apostle Paul uses that word walk four more times. It's found in verse 1 here we see it. It's found uh, the next time he's going to tell us to walk is in verse 17. He tells us to walk in purity the third time. He's going to tell us to walk in harmony. And finally, he's going to tell us to walk in victory. Hey, let me ask you this. Is anyone here tonight interested in walking in victory? Would you raise your hands? Yeah, whoo, so we sit in the heavenlies. I like this. I don't know about you. <laughs> we sit in the heavenlies, then we walk worthy, and finally, we are to stand. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. You know the verse probably. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Brothers and sisters, listen, you know I love you. I've been here for now for like a little over three and a half years. But can I be real frank with you tonight? The very first step to being strong is to realize life is not an encounter group. Life is not a bonding meeting. Life is not a playground. Oh, but church, life is a battleground. And the reason that so many churches are weak today is because they are not armed for battle. Think about this. If the men who stormed the beaches of Normandy on D-Day did so and they were all dressed in their jammies, something would have terribly gone wrong. 
Yet I believe that we live today in a day of jammy Christianity. Let's put on our jammies and let's go talk about how we feel, we'll say in church. Let's have a slumber party so we can all bond together. No, church. Paul tells us, put on the armor to take advantage of the equipment that God has given us to navigate life and to navigate in this war that surrounds us. Those of us who are faithful in Christ, you can stand against the wiles of the devil, those cunning, those clever attacks of Satan. That word wiles, it just simply means it's a method of trickery. You know, the lying in wait. Those of you who are faithful, you can stand against the wiles of the devil, but only to the degree that you are protected with the whole armor of God. That's why the Apostle Paul tells us here in verse 13. He says, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in this evil day, and having done all to stand. Hey, is anyone here believe we're living in evil days right now? Yeah, we are. Child of God, let me just say this. Regardless of where you live, Regardless of what school you might attend, regardless of where you work, hold on to your seats. Regardless of whoever occupies the White House, you can stand. You can be strong because you have been given the perfect defense. And rather than feeling sorry for yourself, put on that armor, church. So tonight... I want to ask you a personal question. Where are you? Are you seated? Are you walking? Or are you standing? I trust that you would be honest with yourself. You'd say, well, you know, Jay, I'm, I'm standing. But I've never been seated in the heavenlies. Or... I've just never really walked with God. I've been trying and trying and trying to make it on my own. And Jay, I am so weary. Church, I came here tonight to tell you that you can start all over again and you can live a life that God has intended for you to have. Would you make that bond with our Lord and Savior right now in the, quiet of the quietness of this moment? We're not going to have any music playing. It's just you sharing your heart with God. Asking God, you know, I, I want to experience that. I want to know what it is to be seated in the heavenlies. Or, Lord, I just want to walk with you every day. It's just a regular part of the day. I want to encourage us all to bow our heads and close our eyes. And you speak to God now. Share with him your heart. It's okay. He has been wanting to hear from you tonight.